over the world, extreme weather is happening more often with greater intensity. And there's nothing normal about it. Dirty energy has created a world of dirty weather. Climate disruption is affecting our food supply, infrastructure, and is creating record-breaking fire, flood, and drought. Now, this year has been one for the record books. Globally, uh, September was tied with 2005 as the hottest September ever recorded. Here in the United States, uh, January through October, the latest data we have, was by far the hottest such period in the history of the United States. And as uh, one of our panels uh, explored in some depth, uh, and one of the scientists here today said was the single biggest uh, uh, event of this past year, the Arctic ice cap melted back to the lowest level it has reached uh, in, in the modern uh, era. Less than half of the Arctic ice cap is left now in the summer months. Uh, and what that does is it changes the heat absorption in the Arctic and it plays havoc with the weather patterns that we have always known. The storm track, the jet stream, where it rains, where it doesn't, when the when when the, uh, the the storms come. All around the world, we have seen these record heat events. And we have built our civilization on the assumption that the temperatures and the climate patterns would probably be pretty much the same ones that we have always known. This is in my opinion, the single most powerful bit of evidence about how the earth is warming. There is no climate science involved. There are no climate models involved. It is purely based on a statistical analysis of what the temperature has been. Jim Hansen and two of his colleagues constructed this. And forgive me for uh, delving into the language of statistics. It's very powerful. I, I wish I had a better command of it, honestly. But everybody knows what a bell curve is. It's the distribution of temperatures, hot and cold. And what they did is very simple. It took a lot of work and a lot of time. But they went back to 1951 and they broke up the Earth's surface into 150 square mile blocks all over the earth. And they collected what the temperature has been everywhere on earth for that entire period. And for the first 30 years, 1951 to 1980, they use that as the period that they compare modern temperatures to. And during that 30 year period, one third of the days uh, were normal temperature, one-third were cooler than normal, and one-third were warmer than normal. So in the 1980s, everything shifted, and all of a sudden, the entire spectrum is warmer. In the 1990s, uh, it, it shifted further, and now we have the appearance of extremely high temperatures. And now, uh, in the last 10 years, compared to what was normal in the years that so many of us grew up in, here's what we have. One normal day, one cooler than normal day, and the rest of it is, is dominated by warmer than normal, and now we have extremely hot days. Now here, here is what this means. These extreme temperature events used to sometimes occur less than one-tenth of, of 1% 1 of the time. Now they occur 10% of the time, up to a 100-fold increase. Again, no climate science, no climate models. 
This is reality. In the United States, the heat records this summer uh, were massive. Never have so many have been broken. The daily uh, temperature uh, comparisons, it used to be one to one. If you had a hot record, you'd have one cold record. Then in the first decade of the new century, it was two for one. It changed. And if you look at the temperature records, 10 hot records for one cold record. All-time records, 115 all-time hot records to only one cold record. The hottest month ever measured in the history, in the recorded history of the United States was this July. Now, this is one uh, uh, set of pictures just to illustrate that the discomfort of people with uh, these high temperatures Heat stroke is a real health problem. We had some presentations about that. This caught my eye because passengers boarded a normal air flight uh, at Reagan National Airport in DC, and the pilot then made an announcement, sorry, everyone's gonna have to get off the plane. Why? Because the runway melted and the plane sank into the runway. The infrastructure that we have built, as I started to say earlier, is based on the assumption that we will have conditions very similar to what we are used to. When it gets this hot, we also have more drought. Rainfall patterns shift. And as most of you know, in the United States of America, 65% of our country has suffered from drought this year. This has a, an enormous uh, impact. This is in Indiana, but it's not just in the United States. This has been happening in areas all around the world. This is in Spain. This is in the Balkans. This is in India this year. All of these are from uh, this year. This is in um, China, uh, I'm sorry, South Korea and North Korea. Both Koreas have suffered through the worst droughts this year since they began uh, keeping records. And in Africa, a, a swath across uh, Northern Middle Africa uh, has been devastated. And of course, the consequences for uh, human health and, and famine. Now, the consequences for higher temperatures and widespread drought for food availability uh, is really beginning to capture a lot of attention. Here is uh, how the food system of the world normally works. Each one of these blocks is a, uh, is a few years. And what it shows is that the, the great surpluses of food are in North America somewhat less so in South America and Australia, occasionally in Eastern Europe and Russia. But the rest of the world is pretty uh, commonly in food deficits. So if the great bread baskets on which the world depends for food are stricken by much deeper and more widespread droughts, what human consequences does that have? Here is in Illinois this year. This farmer said it's like farming in hell. Uh, you have seen the, the stories on the news. Here is in Alabama. This is in Kentucky. Farmers have had a very difficult time. And it's not only the drought. The plant scientists are beginning now to raise alarm bells that the heat itself has an impact when it gets too high. As this scientist here in this city at Columbia says, there's been an under-recognition of the sensitivity of crops to heat. For example, uh, corn, which is the largest crop uh, that is grown in the world, called maize in most of the world, for every degree day above 84 degrees yields decline by almost three quarters of a percentage point. Uh, and by the end of the century, that means that corn yields could, could fall by one-third 
from heat stress alone. Leave aside the impact of drought. Uh, the water that we use in the world, we've had some wonderful presentations about uh, the challenge of water. A little over 10% is for household use, a little under 20% for industrial. The rest of it is agricultural. Now, we are seeing the agricultural water system challenge now. We're all familiar with the fact that in areas of the Middle East, they have these they, great reliance on irrigation. Many people don't pay as much attention to the fact that in our breadbasket in the United States, here in Kansas, the same thing is true. But we are now drawing water from uh, aquifers at an unsustainable rate. And the hotter it gets, the more water uh, these plants need. The, the climate model projections tell us the scientists tell us on the basis of their projections that this can get considerably worse and that what we consider today to be a period of severe drought could, after the changes now in store unfold, be classified as a period of abnormal wetness. Uh, and there is the possibility of much more severe drought. This is an update of a set of images that I showed last year. And I, I want to update it because I consider it to be one of the single most significant facts that we need to take on board. This legend shows uh, drought and wetness. This is extreme drought, uh, exceptional drought, and you don't even want to think about it, drought. Uh, and as you go through the century uh, with business as usual, what you see is that all of Southern Europe, all of Mexico, all of the American Midwest and other areas would be devastated by drought far deeper and far more widespread and far more destructive than anything that we have seen uh, in current conditions. We have to take action to forestall this kind of vulnerability. Droughts lead to the fires, and many of you have seen what happened not only in Colorado, in Colorado Springs, where uh, so many people lost their homes, but all across the American West. Uh, and again, the projections are that if we do not take action, what we have seen thus far is nothing compared to what would happen uh, in Oklahoma as well, uh, other states, uh, and around the world. Again, in Spain, I showed the drought conditions there earlier and uh, in Portugal, in the Balkans, where drought was severe this year. Now, I want to switch gears and recap the story that I earlier said these scientists had marked as perhaps the most significant uh, event of the year in the Arctic. 2,000 years of air temperatures in the Arctic and the most recent observations. And what you see is that in, in the last decades, really the last decade, what we have seen is far different from the previous 2,000 years at least. And when the air temperature goes up, the Arctic ice extent goes down. And again, the most recent observations, one of our panelists was just talking about this, less than half remains. Uh, the previous record was in 2007. This uh, is down by almost uh, as much. A and again, less than half remains. This has an impact not just on the Arctic itself, but on those of us who live in the temperate latitudes. It affects the weather. It affects the climate. Uh, it affects the crops. Now, uh, when the Arctic melts, it doesn't raise sea level. But in Greenland, where the large mass of ice is on the land, that does affect sea level. And the same is true at the other end of the earth uh, in Antarctica. Some of you heard in uh, our 22, the discussion of our trip to Antarctica earlier this year. Uh, this again is a NASA image that shows the flow of melt, melt water melting, well, of ice really, uh, I'm sorry, moving toward the coast. 
and the red areas show uh, the very fast flows of ice into the sea. Both Greenland and Antarctica are melting and moving into the sea uh, at an enhanced rate. And, and in Antarctica, what we're seeing is that the warmer ocean is coming up under the edge of the ice that comes out into the ocean uh, and is causing a degradation of the ice shelf. And it's not only melting, it is that it falls into the sea. Cities at risk from the sea level rise that results from the melting of ice in Greenland and Antarctica, as well as the thermal expansion of the oceans. You'll notice that if, when you rank them on the basis of population at risk, Calcutta, Mumbai, uh, Dhaka in Bangladesh, and so on, when you rank them in terms of uh, assets at risk, number one is Miami, then Guangzhou in China, and then New York, New Jersey. The predictions that scientists have made for years about the vulnerability of New York and New Jersey to higher sea level uh, it is something that many people said, oh, that's unrealistic. Don't even think about that. Well, uh, they, they were wrong and the scientists were right. And the ocean is also getting warmer. Uh, this shows the normal variability in ocean temperature this is what the scientists predicted as a result of global warming. And these are the actual ocean temperatures that precisely match what the computer models and the scientific studies projected. We can't so easily ignore these warnings unless we want to set an ambush for ourselves. This is the enhanced ocean temperature on the day that Hurricane Sandy turned westward toward New York and New Jersey. A nine degree Fahrenheit, five degrees Celsius, nine degree Fahrenheit warmer temperature than normal. These warmer ocean temperatures drive energy into the storms. Uh, and that is why these storms have been getting more powerful. And our hearts go out to all of those who, who suffered as a result of uh, Hurricane Sandy and our gratitude to the first responders and the neighbors and others who have responded so magnificently. But it's going to rank almost certainly just after Hurricane Katrina uh, as uh, the second worst hurricane uh, ever. And of course, you have seen the videos uh, and the pictures, the devastation uh, has been heartbreaking. Uh, and again, I want to thank not only Governor Cuomo, but Governor Christie as well, and Mayor Bloomberg, and all of those who led uh, the response. Uh, and our hearts are uh, continue to be uh, with those uh, who are still suffering and who have not yet been able to put their lives back together. Connecticut uh, also affected. Uh, the entire world was transfixed by uh, the, the horror of these images and the suffering that was caused and the amazing events that uh, many people felt were uh, un unthinkable. So the tunnels and you know the entire story. Uh, and Governor Cuomo went to that evening, as I said, and this is what he said uh, afterwards, that uh, climate change is a reality. People are still uh, getting their lives back together. Now, some of the aftermath left sand all in the streets. I'm showing you this for a reason, because you may, re you may remember the massive floods that hit the Midwest. This is Missouri today, sand all over the fields. We have had more than 10 billion dollar plus disasters uh, in the last year. Tornadoes, the scientists will not yet link them uh, to climate, but these disasters ha have been uh, terrible. And the only plausible explanation 
uh, is climate change. You remember the European heat wave and the Russian uh, dr uh, fires and drought. Uh, and scientists have sometimes said in the past, you cannot attribute any single storm uh, to global warming, but now they're saying all storms are different because of global warming. Because the warmer air holds more water vapor, 7% for each degree, and now uh, there is an extra 4% already in the atmosphere. And when the, the skies open, much more of it falls at one time. is that the average humidity of our planet has increased by 4%. Warmer air holds more water vapor. And so on average, our atmosphere is 4% more humid than it used to be 30 or 40 years ago. So when storms come through, there's more water for them to pick up and dump. That was Newt Gingrich's climate advisor that he uh, uh, asked not to continue working on his book. Uh, but she is an evangelical Christian uh, in Texas. Her husband is a minister. She's a fantastic scientist, and we should listen to her. I'm going to skip uh, through this. We got a late start on uh, uh, the on the slides. I'm just going to show you on the flooding events what the uh, problem uh, has been around the world. Pakistan, of course, two years ago was the huge flood, but once again this year they have been hit. Uh, also, we have seen in Beijing amazing floods uh, in the heart of Beijing this summer. Uh, and around uh, Beijing. These floods, like the droughts, are becoming much more common. Here is India this summer. These floods and droughts are part of the new reality that global warming is creating. Taiwan, this is a building floating uh, away. Again, we saw that the record droughts in North Korea and South Korea as with many places in the world, there are record droughts and record floods. Russia, you may remember the events uh, in July, awful floods, terrible loss of life. Now, this not only affects people and their homes, it affects global systems. We talked about the food supply and electricity and uh, business. Let's talk just for a moment about health. Climate change is disrupting natural systems in a way that makes life better for infectious diseases. I'll give you just a couple of examples of tropical diseases that are now on the move. West Nile virus. You remember going through uh, the news stories on that, and you may know some people uh, who were affected. Rift Valley fever, uh, other tropical diseases that we didn't used to have to think about. Now they have been spreading. And, of course, uh, more than 100 people were killed by West Nile uh, this year. Dengue fever uh, is becoming a very serious problem. We never used to worry about that. Spraying for mosquitoes. A and Scientific American wrote an article showing exactly the ways in which global warming has caused West Nile virus to spread, to become more potent, to spread to other species uh, of mosquitoes. Plant diseases and invasive species also are, are made worse. This is the third largest food crop in the world. Most of us never eat it, cassava, but it is now at risk because of climate changes and invasive species. Soybeans uh, because of higher CO2 concentrations. Uh, these are just uh, some uh, of the problems that we have to deal with. What are they caused by? Again, uh, the massive continuing increase of global warming pollution into a very thin atmosphere where it traps heat. We have to make a choice now. We can do nothing, set an ambush for ourselves and walk into it, or we can lift our eyes to see the kind of future that our children and future generations deserve. I believe we have what it takes to create that kind of future, and I ask all of you to help bring it about. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. <laughs>